Welcome to another Art of Composing Composer Symposium. We are live and I am here to answer your questions. So welcome. If you are new, <coughs> basically it's me sitting in front of the computer and I got my Sibelius up, I got my piano over there, and I'm here to answer your compositional questions. So um, <coughs> normally these go about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, so have your questions lined up, and if you want to, you can send me your score on uh, uh, just in my email, john.branningham at artofcomposing.com, and we'll try to take a look here on the symposiums. I don't get to everybody's score, unfortunately, but I try to do a couple at least. So welcome, Robert. Hello, Clark. Hello, Michael and Andre and uh, Cling to Eggs. I don't know your name, but I know your screen name, so welcome. <coughs> so, so yeah, today... Um, uh, I'm um, as usual. I'm open to anything. Any any kind of questions you have. Hello, Gregory. Um, and yeah, I have been really just uh, working hard on uh, scoring the new soap opera that I'm working on, Hilton Head Island. And I, and I feel like I'm just learning a ton about the way I work, the way I compose, uh, the way I spot things, which is something I've been thinking about today. And I'm actually writing. Another article on it right now, probably going to be posted in the next day or two. Um, but in particular, what I've been thinking about is is how do you end up seeing kind of the through line for music uh, from the beginning of an episode to the end and from episode to episode? Um, it's just an it's an interesting problem to try to think around. So when you're you know when you're watching an episode for the first time, you're kind of experiencing it what I'm finding is going back, watching it multiple times and kind of incrementally adding markers, you know, on each pass through. So maybe just at first general markers where you're saying this is the beginning of a cue, this is the end of a cue, or, you know, this is a very important shift in the mood or, you know, just the, uh, something that describes the emotion. Um, the more specific you can get over time, the easier it is to write the music. If you can say, I, you know, there's a shift here, there's a shift there. Those could be kind of formal barriers where you have one, you know, texture and then you move on to the next texture or a new theme or a new tonality or something like that. So, so yeah, I've just been thinking a whole lot about spotting. And if anybody here has questions on film scoring or spotting or anything like that, then uh, those will be very welcome tonight. But let me go ahead and jump back here. I've got a couple questions. So <coughs> are there going to be any new courses? Yes, there are. But I can't, and I apologize to everybody, but I, ca I can't say exactly when they're going to be out. I, I've been working, you know, I had been working real hard on the orchestration course, and now with having to score this this uh, this series, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not missing any deadlines. So things are moving really at a snail's pace in terms of course creation, although in order to make up for that, I'm doing now daily vlogs if, if anybody hasn't seen them. Um, you can just check out my YouTube channel. You can watch the daily vlogs. I'm trying to answer questions as they come to me or what other people are, are posting on the, uh, on the comments for those videos or if you, you, know, if you just want to email me or something like that. Um, that way I can get out just little, you know, whatever golden nuggets I can dole out there. Uh, hopefully it's, it's useful for people. So, um, but yeah, still still have plans for the orchestration course, uh, and from there, I'm not sure. I, I kind of go back and forth. I know a lot of people want a course on counterpoint. Um, you know, my uh, it, oh, is my mic a little bit quiet? If it's a little bit quiet, I'm going to try to figure out how I can bump up the sound here. Let me turn it up here. Sorry, I think my mic was just a little bit low tonight. Uh, let me know if that sounds better or if it's too loud. Um, Oh, so yeah, so a lot of people have asked for a counterpoint, uh, you know, and kind of harmony. My criteria for like what I'm going to actually pursue with, with some of these courses is, uh, is my teaching really unique? Um, you know, there's a lot of books on counterpoint and a lot of whatever out there. Um, it, but, and I don't want to just regurgitate, you know, that I, I want it to be something unique and, and kind of special. So I tend to spend a lot of time just thinking about how, how to teach a subject or what really makes it tick underneath. So that's what's going on in my mind. Um, so let's see. Any advice for chronic writer's block? Yes, actually, I, I just answered this in one of my vlogs. And 
uh, not so much chronic writer's block, but writer's block in general. However, I think uh, chronic writer's block is just writer's block. And if you got to do the right things to get through it. So the number one thing is just to continue writing. Um, when you are, when you're stuck, um, you know, and I was going through this just uh, a couple of days ago. I just felt like not a lot of great ideas were coming. Um, it's critical that you sit down in that period and just write whatever you're going to write. Um, you know, whether you think it's not very good or you're literally sitting and staring at a blank page, um, just the process of sitting down and putting something like, you know, putting it down, however you're going to do it, your DAW, paper, obviously I like, I like using paper, but the process of sitting down, working through those ideas, you can kind of let go of them. And, and I think a writer's block, if you really think about it and why it, it has that term, um, it's not so much that nothing's there, it's that something's in the way. And you have to pluck that something out of your mind so that you can move beyond it. So you'll find that maybe you got to do that for a day. Maybe you got to do that for, you know, a couple days or, or maybe it feels like a week. If you're getting to this point where it's been like weeks or months since you've composed anything, then it's, it's hard to say it's, it's chronic writer's block and it could just be procrastination. So th there's a difference there in terms of what, what you're trying to tackle. Um, now, beyond that, uh, you know, there are obviously other things that you can do. You can um, listen to some really motivating music for you as a composer. You know, like I, I find that sometimes when I'm feeling just uncreative, uh, I'll go back to what it is that really got me into this stuff. You know, so Mahler, Chopin, Ravel, Beethoven, you know, my favorite composers, Bach, Mendelssohn, Schubert, um, Wagner, Debussy. I mean, you just name it. There's so many great composers and so much great music. And recently, in particular, I've been trying to get into some of the uh, kind of American composers from, say, like the 30s and 40s and 50s. So Howard Hansen comes to mind and Aaron Copland and uh, Samuel Barber. I've been listening to a lot of that music but you got to get back to what it is that really brought you in and kind of carried you, uh, your love of music to the point where you said, I can actually write this myself and I'm going to pursue trying to figure this out. So, um, so yeah, just getting re-motivated on that stuff. Writing, so, you know, writing something that is unconnected with anything else also can help. So if you've got to deliver a score, right, for a, you know, film or whatever, or you've got a commission, sitting down and just, I'm going to write a, a cheapy little ditty for piano, you know, just kind of clearing the cobwebs, so to speak, with those kind of little pieces can actually get you to the point where you're like, hey, this is pretty good, and oh, I'm not a terrible composer, I can keep composing now, and a lot of it is just getting over that mental hurdle of thinking you have, you have writer's block, when in reality, you know, you, the more ideas you put down on paper, the, the more likely you're going to find one that you actually like. And once you find an idea that you like, it's a lot easier to develop. And once you've gotten to the end of something, right, whether it's a, you know, whatever you want to call it, 20, 20 measures, whatever, and you can go back and start really refining it, that's when all, all the creative ideas really start to come out. So, so really, the biggest thing is just work through it. Just continue to compose and, and do whatever you can to recharge yourself creatively. If you've got to exercise, if you've got to you know, go out and see a movie or listen to a, a live concert or or think about, you know, a specific performer and how they would perform your piece and how you would write for them. Uh, you know, there's lots of creative prompts, um, but the important thing is just working through it. Okay, let me, uh, let me go up. I don't know if anybody's emailed me a piece yet. It uh, doesn't look like it. If you want me to check out your piece while you're on here, just email it to me, john.branningham at artofcomposing.com. So um, let me go ahead and continue to check out. How can someone who plays one instrument get into orchestration? Well, if you play an instrument, you've already got a major heads up on, um, on orchestration because whatever your instrument is, you understand the problems that players face. And that is a huge part of the battle is writing characteristically, is really understanding how, do people, how are people limited on instruments um, and and what's very natural and feels good to play. So 
uh, and you're going to understand things in a very organic way. For instance, you're going to understand the different timbres that you get in different ranges. For me, I'm a trumpet player, and uh, when you're playing real low and uh, and loud, let's say, it can kind of sound splatty, like blah, you know. If you're playing kind of in that sweet zone for the trumpet between, you know, C to, I'd say, G, uh, or C, you know, middle C to G above the staff, um, you can have really bright sounds. You can have really dark, soft sounds. Uh, it's pretty easy to play. You can play a lot of notes in one breath. You can play real quiet, real loud. If you go above that, you're, you know, it, it's hard to play quiet. Uh, it'll sound strained, but you can play really loud and powerful. You'll have that kind of understanding in a very organic and natural way, and so you can apply that to the under, other instruments. You know, and chances are too, if you've played in wind bands or you played in an orchestra, you kind of understand like almost like intuition it's like oh man here comes the clarinet squeaks because it always happens at this part of the piece and you can think about it's like well what's causing them to squeak that way it's like oh maybe they're doing big arpeggios up and down and and you know people are hitting the reed too hard or something like that um you start to have those kind of feelings too so playing an instrument is and playing particularly in a wind band or an orchestra or anywhere you're going to be around the kind of group you're playing for um that is one of the greatest educations you can have for orchestration. Now, beyond that, obviously, you want to get a, a, a decent reference book and read through it. Um, I, I read through the entire Samuel Adler book when I really started getting into orchestration. And it's just, it's just useful to know that. everybody, All these different authors have different opinions on orchestration, and you'll start to see what is the same between them, what, what varies. Um, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to memorize all the, you know, the ranges and things like that right off the bat. I would say just having a reference for that is, is good enough. And knowing the, the bottom note and the top note you should be using, that's about it. Um, so let's see, in terms of, you know, getting into it, I would say start real small and restrict yourself, you know. So you can start small in terms of the size of the group. Um, however, I think it's probably useful to to also, uh, you know, experiment with full orchestra. So you can, I would say, starting small in terms of do eight measures, right? Write a theme and figure out, don't change the orchestration from beginning to end. Just stick with one orchestration and uh, try to make it work from beginning to end for that. So let's say you've got a melody and you've got a chord progression and you've got like kind of an accompaniment pattern, right? Like boom, bop, bop, like... Right, you know. Right. If we were to take something like that, and I was just improvising it here. Um, well, you know what? I haven't done this in a while. Why don't we do this? Why don't we orchestrate? Because I think this will be interesting for people. So first, we're gonna we're gonna write something. Um, I probably should open up a an actual orchestra here. So let me close it. Give me just a second, and I'm just going to do like a simple classical orchestra, and I'm going to add a piano. Let's see, piano add. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that down at the bottom. So almost there. Apologies. Okay, and now let me put that up on the screen, and then we're good to go. Here we go. Okay. It's looking a little bit small there. Let me try to get this a little bit bigger. That. Okay, so first we got to um we gotta write a little thing here. So So there we go. That's about as easy as it can be. It's as simple as it gets. Um, and I think I did like oh, too high. Something like this. Let's see. Something like that. Okay, so that, once again, about as simple as it gets.
Now, if we we don't need to know much about orchestration in order to give ourselves uh, an effective orchestration for this. So because we've got you know a, a decent little woodwind spread here, and obviously we got all the strings, why don't we use strings and woodwind? And if you just think about um, you know how could you create a single sound with this that feels like it's coherent from beginning to end? You could say, okay, I'm going to give the melody to one group and I'm going to give the accompaniment to the other group. And within that group, I want to make it a decent, uh, you know, voicing. I want it to feel balanced within itself. And then it's also got a balance among the two groups. So we, we've got a lot of things going for us. Obviously we've got kind of like a bass note being struck here. So I can just go over here and I can give that, I'll take it, take it down to the, uh, give that to the, the bass and I'm going to give him a pizzicato too. And I'm going to also give it to the cello. Okay. That's already sounding pretty good. Um, and then we have this stuff right here. Uh, let's see. I can just go ahead and I'm going to start it maybe. Yeah, I'm going to start right here like that. Oh, no. Maybe I'm just going to do this. All right. And Sibelius, I'm going to give those staccatos. You don't, oh, you wouldn't have to really do this in real life, but I want it to sound staccato and Sibelius. And I think also I want to give this to a uh, note performer to perform. Give you the FX. Uh, bear with me for a second. Okay, if this goes there. So if I keep this, uh, I don't need it. If I keep this like this. Okay, so you kind of get the idea. And this repeats itself like that. We'll do this again. And this. These notes here just have to go down a step. Uh, why don't we just make it end right there? Okay, so we've done that. And now what we can do is just give this melody over to the woodwinds. So we can just go simple. I mean, we could do like flute and oboe or something like that, or we could even give you know one to the violin or something. We'll just see what this sounds like now. Let me go ahead and get rid of this piano part. Okay, so I think that that works out and it's so basic, right? But that's, I think, important here to notice is that you don't have to start off fancy. We're not all Ravel. We're not all Mahler. We're not doing these flourishes and we don't, you know, we don't necessarily have to hand off the melody eight times and 15 different techniques all happening simultaneously while somebody's off stage rustling, you know, cows into the corner because that's some weird instrument Mahler called for, you know. You can start simple. So let's, we've got that, but now let's, let's just change it up. I'll show you how this stuff really can work well. I'm going to add also, let me just add uh, another, let's see, we'll add tuba and trombone. That way at least we've got like a couple different brass. Okay. Oh, yes, let's make it just smaller. And then you'll find that if I just copy and paste this, it's going to work pretty much the same way. Um, and then we'll give the melody over here to the, we'll keep it in the violin. We'll do violin two, viola, and we'll do Oh, that's still pizzicato. We'll go arco here. And then we'll just keep the bass the same also because we kind of plus that up. And you're going to find that it's going to change the feel just a little bit. Okay, I'll just 
I gotta save. I, I keep hitting the save button because it's like a it's like a reaction. <laughs> My finger just goes to hit save all the time. So it keeps popping up. I hadn't actually picked a name for it and saved it. So now I did. That's a good habit to have, I think. Just hitting save all the time because you end up not losing all your work. So let's go ahead and hear what I did. And then why don't we just to round it off, go like this. And we're going to give this to the flute. We're going to give this over to the woodwinds. Oh, I missed the note there. Uh, and then we'll do a huge da -da 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 over the whole orchestra right there. Nothing here should be like shocking what I'm doing. Just basically <laughs> copying and pasting. down there and then we'll just we'll go arco oh, we'll do this make it yeah it's probably too high now yeah, we'll keep it as is okay we'll delete these extra measures no i missed my thing here And I'm just going to delete this piano so it's not there either. Okay. So let's, well, we'll go into the scrolling view and then try to fit it all in. There we go. Let's listen. It should sound like I spent actual time orchestrating this. Okay, so the, the point of that is not to show you how what an amazing orchestrator I am, but it looks simple because it is simple, and yet it works. So that's the critical thing there is that you don't have to get super fancy with your orchestrations. Just keep it logical. It's like, is it within this player's range? Yes. Does it seem like crazy weird music, or is it just kind of normal stuff, like normal shapes to the melodies, normal note rhythms, normal accompaniment patterns? Yes, yes, across the board, all those things. And so you can basically transfer it to any instrument in the orchestra, and anybody can do any role here. I could have given the tuba the melody and had the woodwinds playing, bop, 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 you know, or I could have given, you know, flute and violin one little da, 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 an octave up and then given the melody to the cellos or whatever. It doesn't even matter. It's because if it's like relatively simple, stable things, you're not going to have huge problems uh, that you run into when you start to get really complex with, you know, really complex chords and uh, trying to, sh you know, shift chords from one thing to the to the next. You'll have balance problems. Um, so, so yeah, hopefully that's kind of a good overview of of how to really even start orchestration. It doesn't have to be too scary. Now, I do say that you you should. Um, you should have a basic understanding of just composition in general. Like what I just wrote there is not a very complex piece to write. However, um, I, I do rely on just basics of understanding how to write something quickly using solid form and, you know, using, um, you know, functional harmony and how to properly write a melody, things like that. If that stuff is still hard for you, then you're, you are probably going to feel overwhelmed with orchestration uh, simply because you're having to think of like 10, 15 different things all at once. Um, I wrote that piece first, if you notice, for piano, and then I orchestrated it, which is perfectly legitimate. Don't listen to Rimsky-Korsakov telling you that you got to be orchestrating the same exact second and moment that you're you're composing. It's like, yeah, sometimes sometimes you get an idea for what it's going to sound like, like, oh, I kind of want it to sound, uh, this has got to be in the oboes or something like that. But 
half the time that stuff changes. I'll be writing and I, you know, I, I write an orchestral idea and then I'm like, you know what, this is just not working here. I'm going to give it to this player and I think it's going to work better. And even Stravinsky, who's probably Rimsky-Korsakov's greatest student, you can find his sketches for pieces and you can see how he changes the orchestration from when his initial sketch is happening to what the final product is. So, so you don't have to uh, you don't have to be the quote unquote genius with your orchestration and do it all at the same time. Um, yeah. So start small, stay simple, keep families grouped together. You know, if you if you look at a score, you've got piccolo, flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, contrabassoon, whatever. You start adding a bunch of extra you know woodwinds under that, right? If you're gonna voice a chord and you get one of those each. That's kind of how you should just voice it. Put the piccolo on top, flute underneath that, oboe un underneath that, clarinet underneath that, bassoon underneath that. And I would say that the other, the exception to that is horn probably doesn't need to be, you know, sitting above the trumpet very often. Uh, trumpets can can go very high and, and be quite piercing and bright um, in those upper registers. And, and horn just, it's I think it's prettier a little bit lower down. So... So yeah, let's move on. Let's see what we've got here. I don't know if there's, oh yeah, I've got some uh, pieces. Um, so let's see, we got Catherine. Oh no, I think that's just a uh, separate thing. We've got, uh, this is Chloe and she doesn't have sheet music right now. So we're gonna see if this will Okay, I think you can all hear that. Um, let me just confirm that it's showing up in my, yeah. Go ahead, stop it right there. Um, Chloe, I think that is a, a very nice piece. It, it sounds very good. Uh, it sounds like you understand harmony really well. Um, it it sticks out in my mind that it, it sounds almost like a like a chorale harmonization style, um, and there's uh, that's totally fine. However, my biggest recommendation I, we obviously don't have a score right now. Um, I I think you probably need to you need to vary. Uh, the well, there's a lot of things that you could start to vary in this. If 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 you want to keep that chorale feel uh, for the entire piece, it's a couple minutes, about three minutes long. Um, I think it'll start to feel a little bit stagnant. Uh, so what I would do is I would first just step back. You've got a really good piece to work with here, right? Now you can go back and you can start to recompose and rework things. And I would I would uh, find places where you can start to change the accompaniment style. Right, uh, I I would find places where you can have varying dynamics, take instruments into different ranges. Um, you know, one of the one of the great things about the string quartet um, is that it can just it's got a huge range. You know, it's I don't know how many octaves it covers from bottom to top. I haven't counted, but it's probably like five or six octaves. Right, it's it's a huge amount, and um, it's not that much harder for the players to play high as it is to play low or in the middle range. And so you can very easily, you know, if you've got a repeated idea, let's say, you know, you da, 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 you know, just shift it up an octave. It's a perfect place to do that or change the timbre. 
And really, you know, once you've got the musical material there, that's what you can start to sit back and say, okay, what, what kind of techniques can I experiment with here? I can give them sol ponticello. I can give them sol tasto. I can do short articulations. I can do legato. You know, I can, um, I can create uh, interesting textures playing off of different rhythmic elements between the different, uh, you know, the violins and viola and cello. So there's a lot that you can do here, and you're in such a great position. I, I always say the hardest part is just getting to the end of your piece uh, in a rough draft form. Everything else after that usually becomes a lot of fun. That's where you get to tweak ideas and really experiment and figure out what's working and what's not working. Um, and that's where you can also cut material. If you feel that it's it's taking too long or you, you haven't gotten to an idea fast enough, even if you put it in and even if you like it, don't feel bad about removing some of that material because we're all trying to refine our pieces to get them to the best possible way. So, so that's what I would do. I would just, you know, one of my favorite string quartets of all time is the Ravel string quartet in F. Um, and th the reason I love it is because it's got such uh, a huge amount of, of unique textures and techniques that you can go and pull from. I mean, you know, you've got... Uh, obviously, at, at the opening, uh, you've got um, parallel, or not parallel movement. I guess you do have a little bit of parallel movement. Uh, but you've got homophonic rhythms, right? Everybody's moving generally at the same rhythm. And then that changes to, uh, you know, uh, where you may have a melody and kind of these uh, fuzzier textures, right? You've got cool pizzicato stuff, boop, 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 boop. But right, everybody's heard that in the Ancestry.com commercials. Um, you've got just tons of really cool techniques that he uses. Uh, the things like the, you know, the Boeing, doo -doo 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 -doo, those kind of arpeggios. And you'll, once you look at a texture like that, you can go back and say, where can I fit this texture in? Right? you got to always look at how, it's not just always about you expressing yourself, but it's about you learning in the most efficient way. Go to a guy like Ravel and steal the textures that he does and say, where can I plop this on this piece that I've already written to spice it up a little bit, right? Don't feel bad about doing that. It's your music, and and Ravel didn't copyright, you know, uh, a 16th note trill and somebody doing, um, you know, tremolo underneath that. You can use all of these techniques and really make them your own, but the only way you'll ever make them your own is by actually trying them out in some way. So, yeah, really good piece. Thanks for sharing. And let's, let me jump back here. I think I've got a lot, of, a lot of comments in the chat. I haven't really been paying attention. I'm sorry. When I'm doing the composing thing in Sibelius, I, I find it hard to split my attention. Mm. Okay, let me find another question here. Uh, mm, let's see. Can you... Describe your process for composing and scoring and realizing a typical week of your SOAP episode. Yeah, I can. Um, so I work in Digital Performer, and um, I don't... I'll open up uh, an episode right now and try to show you, actually. Uh, let me go ahead and close something here. So And then give me a second, because this is going to just take a second to load. So I'll receive an episode, and um, I like to sit down and just watch the episode. Uh, just try to get my first impressions on it. You know, I, I don't want to necessarily jump right in and start saying, oh, I absolutely need to put this here. I need to put that there. Sometimes you do get a feeling about something. You, you know, you're watching, and you're like, oh, that's a huge moment. I, t I totally need to, uh, need to do something there, you know. Um, and I've got some kind of big templates. So let me go ahead and, and create a, a new one here. And, and just give it a second to start up. So right now I'm not connected to my Vienna Ensemble Pro setup. Let me go ahead and, and pull something on screen. Let's see. Uh, and Digital Performer is... Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is my digital performer. Um, and let me get a little bit bigger. Sorry, you're staring at a black screen. I'm trying to find, like, what's the right window to show. Unfortunately, I, you know what? I, I think I can actually just change this to my desktop. <laughs> one, get, just give me uh, one more second here. Let's see. 
display capture. Ah, okay, that's not what I want. There we go, that's what I want. So in Digital Performer, I've got a pretty big template set up. Um, and uh, what this template has is all of my uh, MIDI, all of my auxiliary, or sorry, all of my MIDI tracks set up that are uh, routed to my Vienna Ensemble Pro, and then the audio comes back into auxiliary tracks, and then that goes into my stems up here, which I can then record to get the audio files. And when you're working with stems or a multi-track, depending on who you're delivering to, um, a lot of times they want the individual thing, so they want strings high and low, or they want brass high and low, and um, or sometimes they just want a full mix. It's it's up to whoever you're delivering to and how they're going to be mixing in the music. Um, but really what this template allows me to do is not worry about setting up a template every time. I mean, it's a major pain. I've got a huge orchestra set up. I've got lots of different instruments here. Uh, all Everything's kind of pre-mixed a little bit so that the volumes are, are good and correct. Um, so it's just a big... Uh, you know, a big plus to have this here set up. And um, what I'll do is I'll then uh, bring in the movie, right? So if I just I just select one of these things, and um, I'll then go through and I'll I'll watch a whole movie. Now I I don't have permission to show anything right now, so I'm not going to show anything. Um, but while I watch the movie, I'm obviously I'm thinking about where music's got to go. But the f initial watching, I just try to experience it like anybody would experiencing the story. So, uh, you know, just watch it like it's a normal TV show because that's where you're going to get the good gut feelings about, um, you know, where uh, certain things need to happen. Um, you know, that where the, where the real emotional points are, and uh, you know, I get to experience it. Um, and, and go through the ups and downs, just like anybody watching the soap opera, uh, which with soap operas, there's lots of ups and downs. They like to be very dramatic. Um, and then what I'm trying to do now uh, it, in order to address some issues of not exactly knowing where the best place to, to, to place a cue or, or when the next cue should come, I'm trying to give it a couple good watch-throughs just really just paying attention to the story, paying attention to the arc of the story and, and where I need to push things along or maybe where we just need to have no music and just dialogue. Um, and then I'm kind of incrementally going through and adding markers. So while I'm watching, I may say, uh, you know, over here, that's that's an important thing, right? That's maybe uh, somebody somebody died, right? <laughs> it's really important. Um, and maybe that's all I get on the first watch through. But then when I come back here, and I may say, you know what, that's really where things start to heat up. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to say that's where things are heating up. And um, it may be on the third watch that I say, okay, I need to actually start my cue right here. And that's that's going to be M01. I'm going to say that's a start. And that way I can make better decisions about not just m the music in the moment, but how does all of the music fit over the entire uh, you know, episode or from episode to episode, half of the battle is just getting a good feeling about what needs to be here. You know, like, do I need to make it sadder? Do I need to make it feel, you know, more intense? Does it need to be picked? Does, does there need to be a tempo? Is there something like a bomb about to go off in another part of the city and I need to make it feel like the bomb's ticking here? You know, all of these kinds of things, they only become apparent to you after watching it a little bit. Um, and up till now, I've, I've had a, the major benefit of really having a lot of time with the short films I've done, um, you know, where a, a director will contact me early in their process. Sometimes I've even gone, gone to the filming, um, and we get a lot of time to discuss it. Here, it's new episode every week. Let's, let's get it done. We, we don't have a lot of time to, uh, you know, dilly-dally. So these real targeted spotting sessions where I'm really sitting down and going through the film multiple times, uh, and trying to find those locations where music starts, music stops, big formal articulation points. So that's something important to me too. I like to, and let me uh, go ahead and switch over here for a second. Um, I like to actually print out sheet music and go through the score by hand. I've talked about this in the past. Um, that can only happen if you've taken the time to figure out what needs to be there. Otherwise, 
I find if I haven't really spotted well, I haven't taken the time to digest it, understand the shape of the music overall, that when I sit down with the, the sheet music at the piano, I can't, I can't guide the music in the same way that I do when I'm sitting at the doll watching the film and composing here, right? Uh, so, and let me just unpack that for a second. When you're sitting down in your DAW and you're watching the film, you can experiment, right? I can play something here and I can see how does that feel against the picture. When I'm sitting at the piano, I don't have that benefit. I, I can just imagine, right? However, your imagination, if you let it run wild, can be very powerful and can bring you to an idea really quickly and really efficiently without having to test it out, right? But you can only do that if you've taken the time to digest what you're looking at. Otherwise, if you don't, if you jump into that a little too early, you're going to find that you're floundering and you need to see the picture again. Um, and I think that's something that's really amazing about uh, you know, film composers from, say, the 30s and 40s, they didn't have the benefit, really, very often of having quick access to the film all the time. Uh, you know, they would have to watch it, take a lot of notes, probably watch it a couple times in a little viewing theater. Uh, and if they're lucky, and I don't know when the moviola or whatever was invented, um, you know, they may have had some contraption at home to be able to watch reels there and and check against the timing and things like that. But they had to remember all that, sit down at a piano with timing notes, and then compose away and just really kind of cross their fingers that it would work. Uh, but I think that's a skill. That's not just magic. It's not they're just amazingly born with these things. That's a skill that we can all work on is our our story memory, our scene and you know visual memory, and our musical and creative memories, all these these things that we have to remember when we're when we're scoring. Um, the more you don't have to rely on watching it in the moment, I think the more your brain and your subconscious, and I really think a lot of the composing happens when you're not sitting at the piano and not at your computer, but a lot of that stuff uh, can work through in your subconscious. You're sleeping, you're in the shower, you're going on a run, whatever. You sit down, and this always happens. Like the third, the third day of composing is usually the most fun, and I get through the most material, and that's because I've spent – two previous days of that really slugging through things, you know, like, okay, let's get this one done, right? And maybe I'll only get one cue done on the first day and then maybe two cues on the second day. But I've now thought about the music so much in that moment that I will get, you know, seven cues done on the third and f or, or fourth day or whatever. Um, I'll just knock out a ton of music. And and it's because you have been composing that whole time. All those other cues and all those other scenes, they're working away. Uh, and now getting into episode four, I also have the benefit of I've written three other episodes full of themes. I've got new themes in episode four. And I've, I'm pulling from these. I'm starting to catalog and, and write down notes on all these themes. If I've got something that's like tempo 130, you know, action is feeling like it's getting tenser and it relates to these two characters. They were there. I can now take all those notes as, uh, you know, um, as things that I can pull from and, and really start to use in future episodes. So um, now the actual process of composing is really not all that different from everything else that I do. I mean, just showing you how I composed and orchestrated that little thing earlier, it's the exact same thing. It's no different. Thinking up music and trying to get it down on paper or get it down in Sibelius or in Digital Performer. Um, and I use the same tools that I teach in Art of Composing. So I'm using, uh, I, I don't really have to look at the harmony chart, but I'm referencing the harmony chart mentally to think of where can I go with this? How can I modulate? How can I do things? Um, you know, writing melodies. I, I stick to tendency tones. I try to, and, and when I'm staying away from that, I try to deliberately stay, you know, or do something deliberate. Uh, and I don't have my piano sound up right now, but but maybe I'll jump to awkward intervals if I'm trying to make somebody feel awkward, or, or I'll I'll make things tense by going to a, a minor ninth or a major seventh or something like that. Um, I use all of these tools in my scoring work. Mm. So thank you for the question, Gregory. I think it was a very good one, and I always love talking about my process here and just and just chatting about film scoring. Um, I need to bring on my buddy Tim, who's a, a composer out here. We will have, we'll chat for an hour and a half about orchestrating some cue or something like that, and we just really get deep into the weeds on technicalities. I think it'll probably be interesting for everybody. Um, okay, so let me go ahead and uh, 
move down here, um, find another question. Uh, people, oh, the commenter is asking how people normally send me pieces. If you want, uh, I prefer Music XML uh, just because it it gets rid of any for or any kind of um, cross platform issues, any kind of uh, Sibelius, the finale to Muse score, or even older versions and new versions of Sibelius. So send it to me in Music XML format. Um, let's see. Here's another question: How do you balance working on multiple composition projects without getting overwhelmed? So uh, yeah, overwhelm can suck. And I would say first, don't overbook yourself. Obviously, you know, you, you need to know that you can handle it. And that's a big part of it. When, when I was asked to score this, if I had been asked, you know, two years ago, it probably would have really scared me. I'd be like, oh my gosh, an episode a week. I don't even know really how to do that. But now it's not that intimidating because I know how much music I can write in a day. I know generally, how my arc is a lot of times I won't feel like I'm getting much accomplished in the first two days and then third and fourth day things to really, really start to come together. Um, so uh, uh, knowing your limits, knowing how you work, how quickly you can work, um, th those all go into not allowing you to feel overwhelmed. Um, working every day that you're supposed to be working, that's critical. Try not to procrastinate. You know, if you've got to deliver on time, sit down, at whatever time is your chosen time for the day and start to work. I'm a morning person and I like to start work early. I usually am up at like 4.30, 4 o'clock. Uh, recently it's been around four. Uh, my wife is getting ready to start uh, going to college here just this next week. And so a lot of her classes are early afternoon. So I don't even have a choice. I just have to get up early and do all my work then. But if you get up at four in the morning, you work four, five, six, seven, maybe eat breakfast around eight o'clock, you know, nine, 10, 11. By noon, you're talking, you've done eight hours of work. That's a full day. And it feels really good too. I, I like getting things accomplished early and then having the rest of the day to relax. Um, so, so that's critical is sitting down and actually just doing the work. And, um, you know, that's, that's basically it. I, I think overwhelm comes from having too much. Uh, and so maybe you got to start clearing your plate. Now, there's a lot of other things that can cause stress in your life. Obviously, if you have money trouble, that can cause a lot of stress. If you're not exercising, I'm a huge proponent of exercising. I love to run. I actually uh, kind of hurt my foot <laughs> the other day. I, I have a cuboid, cuboid syndrome. Uh, so I've got some pain kind of in the middle of my foot, uh, and it's taken about a week or so, week and a half to, to fully heal before I can get out and run. So I've been mountain biking. <laughs> so I haven't been running, but I've been mountain biking. And the whole point of it is that you've got to work off steam. You've got to work off that stressful energy. Um, and often when you're running, your mind is, is focused on other things. You're focusing on the next foot in front or whatever you're listening to on your, uh, you know, on your iPhone or whatever. And, that's when your good ideas start to come. So if you're not exercising every day, uh, you need to start. And it just in general, it's healthy. I mean, if you're a professional composer, chances are you're sitting at, at your desk at a computer chair, staring staring at the, this is what my screen sees all day long, is me going, I guess moving little MIDI bars around on the screen. That it can be really hard on your body, just sitting here with the pressures and things like that. Um, you know, you, you, need to, you need to get out there and... and and just enjoy life a little bit, but make sure you're working every day. So um, let's see. Let me find another good question here. Uh, let me f oh, maybe somebody sent me another piece. Let me let me check. Oh, got a couple here. Okay, we got the next one up is uh, Lux. So this is. Um, Bagatelle number one, hopefully, if you sent me in Sibelius format, oh, here we go, perfect, XML, because I don't know, a lot of people, I haven't upgraded my Sibelius, um, so I'm still on seven point whatever. Let me go ahead and reopen Sibelius, quit digital performer, and once again, give me a second here. Sorry, I know this is dead air. It always takes a moment for everything to uh, start up. And hopefully this 
works out. So let's see, we got, I got this going and zoom out. I'm going to hide the pedal lines because they're all over the place because music XML. So let me just, uh, let me pull this up so you can see it. Okay, there we go. Filter, kind of pedal lines. Oh. And then I'm going to hide all those. And we're gonna just remove all the invisibles. There we go. Okay, let's go ahead and listen to this. Oh, hold on. This is for piano, so I'm going to use Sibelius sounds because the one thing no performer needs to just abandon whatever piano sound they're using right now and just give us a normal sounding good piano, not like a, uh, <laughs> look, sounds like they're <laughs> hitting piano strings with a hammer. So I, no performer, if you're watching this, which probably not, <laughs> um, I love no performer. I think it sounds really great. A lot of the stuff is really good, but the piano just has to be better. I don't know. Just, just get us a better piano. Okay, I'm going to stop us right there because there's still quite a bit uh, uh, to listen to here, but I, I think I, I've got some pointers for you. So I would say first off that you've got some really, you know, beautiful textures and patterns and um, and shapes going on. In particular, uh, I really liked this measure 16 here. I just think that's that's really good work. That that's very interesting to listen to. It's got interesting rhythms, um, and you're using you know ranges on the piano really well. So, uh, well done there. Um, I think there's a little bit of I don't know if I've got a good name for it, but it's like, and I you know don't be offended by this because we've all done it, right? I've done it, uh, and everybody else has done it. But you you kind of have a little bit of an idea. And then you don't quite know where that idea needs to go. So you kind of do this hunting and pecking, you know. Uh, right. And, um, and I can tell that's where, you know, it's, uh, I'm trying to think where, where I hear it. I'm kind of over here. So here's an idea, maybe a little bit of hunting and pecking there. So what I would say is that this is almost like sketch material to me. It, um, this is like a lot of raw material that can all be actually expanded into a really tight-knit, solid piece of music. And I would say, look at what I've put out on small ternary form. It's, it, you can actually watch um, a lot of it just on YouTube from the free course. Uh, but if you type in small ternary form on YouTube, you, 
hopefully you can find my video. Um, sticking to a solid, well-known form can really help you hone in on or home in on what it is that is the really good material here, right? If I were to, uh, you know, take some some ideas, I, I think you've got kind of an interesting texture here at the beginning. Um, it, it's notated a little bit in a confusing way, so I would maybe think about trying to correct the notation. Now, once again, I don't know, maybe this could have been Music XML giving me something weird here. Um, but I would maybe try to clean that up, but keep that as almost uh, introductory material, right? You, you, you are maybe outlining a harmony here. You know, doing some, and then, and then going to where you know you've got some really solid melodic ideas. So this kind of thing here, right? That's that's kind of a a unique rhythm uh, that you can add to it. And now take the that original idea and try to write a tight knit basic idea and stick to a form. So if we, you know, I probably won't even be able to play this very well, but. <laughs> yeah, which is one of the problems with the way you've notated it. It makes it kind of difficult to play. Let me go ahead and just press play on it. Okay, so you've got that. That almost feels like uh, an idea in itself. And the way you've notated this, um, it could probably be expanded into, you know, uh, into doubling the notation length that maybe probably make it a little bit easier to, to read, but if you just repeat this idea, right, it's got a very open feel to it with the, right, you've got a uh, fourth E chord right there, um, but repeating it, it just sounds good, and then this is where you can start to do things like, you know, changing the register, but keeping all the material the same, let me delete that. Right? That, that just sounds cool. And then now you know I've got to do a continuation. So where am I going to take this? Uh, let's see. Da, da, da. I, would, I would try to make this a seventh chord. Or sorry, a dominant chord. Right? And then let's add... Okay, well, this is now starting to sound a little bit like a, a, a period where I've got an antecedent consequent. Um, which... There we go. That's kind of the nature of composition. You plan to do one thing and then it turns out totally different. I'm going to go ahead and add a measure here. Oh, let's add an instrument. Uh, let's see, add single bar. There we go. Now, if I, add, if I replay this, listen to the flow of this and how this feels like it's going somewhere. And I haven't changed much. So obviously there's there's some work that needs to be done harmonically, um, but I would say just taking a step back now, taking account of what you have, finding those core melodic ideas, so your basic ideas, uh, and figuring out how it can go. I, I see that being your basic idea for your exposition, um, and over here, I see this being your contrasting middle. Uh, that's just really beautiful. I feel like you could have really kept that going another, uh, at least another measure or two. Um, you know, let's see. Just just dropping this down by step. So. Well, you see, I didn't drop the whole thing down, but but playing around with that texture as your contrasting middle, I think, will be very useful and and sound really great. Um, so, Lux, thank you for sending that piece. Hopefully, that was enough information for you there. Um, I, I think you've got something really nice here to work with, but it does need work, and you need to really get in there and uh, and focus on finding the core ideas, identify those spots that you feel like that you deep down you know like 
I could do better in, in this spot. I think we all know when we're checking the block, so to speak, or phoning it in as a composer. You know, when we get to this section, we're like, I just don't know what to do here. So I'm going to put a placeholder. I'm going to just go. And then now I know what to do here. <laughs> you know, whatever you're doing. I know that was just the worst music. But um, but the point is, is that you can uh, you can put those placeholders in, but but call them what they are. They're, they're things that you know you could do a little bit better on, but you've got some really great material there, so I wish you the best of luck on your piece. Let me go back here. Oh, wrong button. Boom. There we go. So, okay, let's... Uh, Let's keep jumping down here. We're at an hour, so I probably won't be sticking on too much longer. Let me just go ahead and say, if you're interested in learning to compose, um, I want you to check out my website, www.artofcomposing.com. I have courses that are really foundational, very thorough, teach you everything that I'm talking about here. Um, and uh, I think they're really useful for anybody who's wanting to learn to compose. So Music Composition 101, all the fundamentals. Music Composition 201 over here is the is focusing on sonata form and how you can take something, you know, an eight-measure theme and turn that into a four- or five-minute piece of music, you know, in full sonata form. And we go bar by bar through Beethoven. It's I think it's really interesting. Okay, let me go ahead and move on to another question. Can you show an example of extending a piece uh, using loosening or tightening techniques for an A, B section? Uh, yeah, I... I guess, uh, let me see. Um, well, okay. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull up that, that little orchestrated piece that we just did. So let me try to pull that up for a second. Uh, let me switch to Note Performer. And let me go back here. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Sibelius. Okay, so we're back in the, the orchestrated piece. Um, now, I'm not going to do full-on, like, A, B, you know, write a, a full theme right now. Uh, however, I can show you kind of the concept of, of loosening techniques. So what we have here is pretty tight-knit, I would say. You know, it's not, it's hard to classify as a theme. I mean, it's, it's basically four measures. You could call it, uh, you know, maybe a little sentency feeling thing. Um, however, it's really just a four-measure, you know, idea. Maybe you could call it an antecedent phrase that I just keep on copying and pasting. Um, however, there's ways to expand these and I'm going to go ahead and add the piano again, uh, so that we can compose it there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do a little bit of loosening on this bar right here. So if we listen again, or let me do it in the strings. Um, okay, so it's pretty clear what's going on there. It's just right, we're kind of outlining uh, five, six, four, five, five, three kind of movement going from five back to one. Right, nothing really crazy spectacular there. Or I think I said five, six, four. It's just five to one. Technically, it's five, six. It's in first inversion. Now, if I want to expand that idea, right? We're going internally. So we're going to take this measure and instead of plopping on an extra chunk, or let me let me step back. If let's say I want to extend the idea, I can take a formal little chunk like that, just a little thing, right? And I'm going to add a another bar there and I'm just going to repeat it, right? I have just ex I've just extended that by adding another little formal section. Uh, and I can always change the orchestration, right? So I can do this, uh, although it's really low. Uh, and it's, yeah, that'll probably sound okay. So if I play it now, let me play from right here. I, I probably should have given this little thing to like maybe the horn and, and taking it out of here like this to change it up right now 
obviously not the most nuanced orchestration. I mean, I'm just trying to get these these ideas down quickly. But that's what I would call an extension. You're just taking a little chunk and you're extending it. Now, you can change the musical material in there. I would just set an exact copy of it. Um, however, I could have changed the tonality. I could have modulated up a th minor third or a major third. I could have, you know, cont I could have done it a little bit different. Um, now, if I wanted to expand this idea, uh, you know, what you're doing is you're taking, you're kind of stretching the idea out. Now, now you can do it by doubling the note length, but that's not that's not the most interesting way to do it. You know, if I kind of do this thing. And then turn these all to half notes. That's like it's like the cheater's way to expand. Let me just copy this or repeat that because the harmony doesn't change. So let's listen. The easy way to expand. So right there, we expanded idea by stretching it out. Now we could we could do that, um, or maybe a more interesting way would be to do something like this. Right now, I've written slightly different melody, um, and and um, I think I had. This was down, and then this goes down here. But I, I, I haven't done much change, right? I, I still kept the same harmony going, but I just made this last, this gesture now, it's still kind of, it feels the same, but now it lasts just a little bit longer. And, you know, maybe I'll, now that I'm doing this, I'm going to go the uh, melodic minor here, the descending melodic minor. Um, there, there may be a little bit of a, a clash between those notes, but I don't think it's going to sound bad. Uh, let's listen. Oh, you know what? I was wrong. I think it may sound better with the minor second. Or sorry, the um, uh, augmented second. Um, dripped a little water there. So that's the concept of when you're expanding something. You're going inside of it. You're kind of pulling it a, a little bit longer. It's internal to a formal element. So you can you can blow this idea up a little bit and say you can do that to an entire uh, you know phrase, like your antecedent or your consequent phrase. You can make the whole antecedent a little bit longer. Or you can do it to an entire theme. You can extend the theme by adding formal chunks to it. You can expand the theme by making individual ideas maybe from two measures to three measures. Um, and and that's really, I would say, the limit. A after that, you're kind of talking sections, and I, I really focus more on the, the thematic level and the idea level. Um, so hopefully that answers enough of your questions on that. I do talk at length about expansion and extension and uh, you know asymmetry and interpolation, which is similar, but it's adding unrelated material. So something that feels just completely out of left field um, while you go along. So uh, let's see. Let me see if there's any more big questions. Let's see. Have you studied the Schillinger system of musical composition or Sergei Taneyev's convertible counterpoint in the strict style? Actually, I have read through, not all the way, through both of those books. And um, the Schillinger system, to me, has a lot of cool ideas and a lot of power. However, it's a little bit messy. Um, so I know some people are teaching it online. Uh, I just haven't dove deeply into it because it's kind of hard to get the really good material um, and if you've ever tried to read the books, they're just, they're so long and they weren't really his books. They were his notes and he, he wasn't really finished, uh, before he died, uh, Schillinger. And then Taniev's convertible counterpoint, same kind of thing. It's, it's a translation of it that I got and, and it's not, I, I found it a little bit hard to decipher. So I kind of just left it alone and, and moved on to other stuff. 
but um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm always interested in composition systems. I don't I don't turn up my nose at, at cool techniques and tricks of the trade and, and ways to come up with cool ideas. Um, you know, at a certain point, it's he, he's got almost like mathematical equations to do things like, uh, and I'm talking Schillinger now, to create like cool rhythms or cool melodies and things like that. And um, I think that's fine to a certain point. It it starts to feel like you're not creating it as much. However, I don't mind if somebody uses a rhythm generator to come up with a, a, a cool rhythm that they then use to compose or, you know, uses tools to come up with chord progressions that they then use to compose. I, I think, you know, we, we need to enjoy what we're doing. Now, if you're pressing a button, the computer's doing every some AI systems doing everything and, and you didn't write anything, it's like, what's the fun in that? <laughs> you know, so that's kind of where I, I set the limit. Um, so let's see. Uh, any composing tips? What form do you like the most? Uh, I mean, I like all the forms. <laughs> They've all got really cool things that can happen. And I love it when people take forms and do their own things with them. I find studying, uh, you know, real pieces and picking apart the form is a great way to, to learn. Um, and do I have any composing tips? Yes. Watch every symposium I've ever done because I put out tons and tons and tons of tips. Hopefully uh, you can find them. So let's see. Would you compose the entire episode in the same home key or how do you pick a key for each part? Uh, this is, I assume, for the soap opera. I jump around all over the place. I'm antsy. I know there's benefits to sticking to one key because when this thing can lead into the next. But you know what? Um, just get creative with it. If you've got to figure out a way to get from C major over to, you know, uh, a flat major without it being shocking change, then then do it. I'm all over the place. I, I like to just switch keys all the time. Uh, and I like to switch keys within pieces as well. I don't like to stay in the same key very long. I don't like to stay doing the same thing with my music very long. I mean, maybe I'm just too antsy with it, but it's just like if, I'm, if I've written 16 measures and things haven't drastically changed, I'm like, oh, I'm just copying myself too much. I need to move and do something new. So maybe that's just me. Uh, let's see, let me keep on going here. This is like lightning round. Um, so let's see. Somebody said the playback was a little bit wrong. That's the commenter. I'm not sure which piece uh, I assume was the, it was the last piano piece. Um, so I apologize if the, the playback is a little bit wrong on it. I, I think uh, in, in general, hopefully it was close enough and, and you know what I said um, uh, helped. So let's see. How do you overcome anxieties about having your pieces played in front of a live audience, especially if you're a beginner? Well, you know what? I am somewhat of a stoic. I would say don't worry about, especially if you're a beginner, don't worry about what other people think about your music. Worry about what you think about your music. So, uh, and let me just take this Sibelius off because it's kind of in the way. Um, we're all going to write music that we're proud of, and we're all going to write music that we're not proud of, and you know the difference between where you are and where you want to go. So if you write a piece and and it's very simple and it doesn't sound like your hero composer over here, um, that's absolutely fine because you understand that that's the case. You are actually identifying that it's not where you want to be yet. It's where you want to go. Um, or it's not where you're at. It's where you want to go, right? And there's a difference between those two. I want to be able to orchestrate like Ravel and Mahler and Debussy uh, and John Williams, obviously, and and these great composers who are amazing orchestrators. And I'm not there yet. I, you know, I readily admit that I can't do what they do yet. But it's in spotting that that you understand what you have to work on. And I would say there's absolutely nothing like having your music performed and having people listen to it. And it's just such a great feeling, especially if you're writing for real people who are playing those instruments and it's not just playing an MP3 or whatever. Um, there's just something special about making music and making that for people to hear. I mean, that's why we do this stuff. I want people to listen to my music, right? And it's not, I, it's not that I want to become super famous or anything like that. I want them to enjoy music as much as I enjoy music. I mean, you get me with a Mahler, you know, symphony and my good headphones and a little glass of wine, right? I'm having such a great time. I'm loving it. I sit back. I just relax. I just you know, breathe in the music. It just feels so good. I want other people to enjoy music the same way, and I want them to enjoy my music the same way. And so that's what I'm striving for, right? 
Uh, but ultimately, I enjoy my music. And I enjoy composing my music, hearing my music played back, and, and particularly hearing it uh, you know, played back by real people. Recording sessions are always really amazing because you can hear somebody interpreting what you've done and changing your ideas just a little bit, just enough to give it that extra human touch. And, and the human touch is not necessarily the realism of the playback, right? We're always striving for our mock-ups in film scoring to be better and better and our orchestra to sound even more realistic than it is. But the human touch is, is humans changing things to be their own, right? That's what makes it special, I think. It's just that that's why we collaborate. If I, I could sit here and I could learn everything there is about making a movie and writing stories and cinematography and stuff, um, but it's not, it's not special in the sense of if I get together with a director and he's got an amazing story or she's got an amazing story and they've taken the time to to craft it and they've given it over to a cinematographer who you know came up with amazing shots and then you've got motion graphics and whatever whatever's going on and then they come to me the composer and I can add my spirit and my soul to that music um, and that's what collaborations about that's what concerts are about that's why you're composing um, so you know be proud of the music you're writing even if it's even if you're a beginner, everybody starts as a beginner. And if you don't believe me, go listen to Mozart Symphony One. And it's not, he didn't start with Symphony 40, right? He didn't start with the Dissonant Quartet um, or the Marriage of Figaro. He started with some very basic, boring sounding pieces compared to what he did later in life. But I'll bet you, you know, five year old Mozart or seven year old Mozart just really enjoyed playing those pieces and listening to those pieces. So, um, and then work out. <laughs> I can't say it enough. Go go for a walk. Go running. You know, uh, do whatever you got to do. Play a video game for a little bit. Get your mind off of it, and just let the music be a little bit. Um, you know, I was just telling my wife earlier. Like, I don't think it's wrong that I sit down and I listen to my music occasionally. I I enjoy what I do, um, but I don't do that very often, and I try to work out a lot. So there we go. Uh, okay, last couple questions here. How would a composer hire musicians to play their music? Well, um, uh, in Hollywood, we have contractors. So you, you get to know a contractor and you say, I want to hire people to do this. There's obviously lots of places online. Um, I've worked with the New Media Orchestra out in Armenia. It's a friend of mine uh, who did the film scoring program here. I helped do their website. NewMediaOrchestra.com is a great place to get your stuff recorded. Uh, but there's also, you know, there's the $99 orchestra. There's, uh, you know, um, Budapest. Uh, there's all sorts of these kind of places online. And then if you're, you're trying to find local musicians, um, you know, just go to Google and type in whatever you're looking for, string quartet in San Antonio, Texas, or whatever, wherever you are, and whatever you're looking for, start Googling around, you know, trumpet player in, in, uh, Los Angeles, California, and you're going to find people. There's Facebook, there's LinkedIn, uh, ask other composers who are local to the area, uh, and, and yeah, it's not that hard to find um, musicians to hire. Oh, and a big one, obviously, if you want to go union, you can look for your local AFM, um, the uh, what is it, American Federation of Musicians, if you're in America, or whatever your you know whatever union you've got in your country, um, and just call them up, say I want to hire some musicians to to play, so and they'll definitely hook you up because that's what their whole purpose in life is that's the unions try to help them get work so um let's see uh, i don't think i've got any more time to do any more uh, pieces of music what references could you give on contemporary classical forum any examples um, of forum ideas you know i don't have a lot of references on contemporary forum i think because it's just been so open-ended it's it's hard to state the contemporary classical form is this um and and classical itself is an era that was like 200 years ago. So, um, so I would say I like a lot of the ideas in traditional classical form. Um, and the way I try to comprehend it is how does your music relate to time, beginning, middle, and end. So just start with that and, and try to think of how you can come up with new ideas about that, right? We've got quantum physics. You can figure out how does particles go backwards in time and forwards and being pushed from the side and, you know, uh, affecting something a million miles away at the exact same moment. That's like quantum physics. It blows my mind, but it's new ways to think about time and how you can 
represent that in music. I don't know. Something interesting for you. Um, okay, I think that's it for the night. My voice feels like it's about to go. Hopefully you had fun. I had a lot of fun here, and I'll be posting my... Uh, I've finished and edited my vlog. I just need to upload it. So be checking out the vlog for the latest episode tonight. Um, and I compose a chord progression in it using the, the chord progression chart. So thanks, everybody, for showing up. And I will see you. Actually, I'm doing every two weeks now because the vlog is, is taking up a lot of my time every day. So uh, I'm not doing a weekly symposium, although if you were around the other night, you'll notice that I'm doing some occasional impromptu, like 10-minute symposiums that are designed for me to just answer a few questions randomly, and I don't announce them, so subscribe and, and sign on for notifications. Otherwise, you're going to miss out. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Goodbye.